we must know why this universe is bilateral instead of radial. This means that we should know why mass spins upon a shaft instead of around a center. This also means that we should know why the inward explosion, which basically causes motion in this zero universe, is a centrifugal spiral and why it is returned by radar to the zero of its source as a centrifugal spiral. If we first grasp this one ideal, we will then know why electricity explodes from the inside outward to divide stillness into pairs of spinning rings. We shall also know why electricity compresses inward from the outside to form solids. Let this be our first lesson. Lesson in cause. Here's this chart. Every effect of nature is divided into pairs of opposites. Each one of each pair is the reverse of the other. Each one is like a mirror reflecting the other. Nature is like unto a clock with two hands which bend away from each other in opposite directions but equal potentials. If one hand multiplies potential, the other simultaneously multiplies it equally. If one hand divides it, the other hand simultaneously divides it equally. Nature will not allow her balance to be disturbed. Each polarized hand moves away from the other from zero to four. Each then reverses its polarity from a charging body to a discharging one. Generation also reverses and becomes radiation. Heating bodies cool. Living bodies die. Solids become gases and dissolve. Fast motion slows until it ceases. The Cosmic Clock Illustrating the impossibility of disturbing the balance of God's universe by even the weight of one electron. If you should cause an explosion in the very center of a perfectly spherical room, you would form spherical layers of increasingly dense pressures which with maximum density at the surface of the sphere. The center of the sphere would be maximum in vacuity. The explosion would be symmetrically radial. The reaction to that explosion would also be its reverse. The reflections which would return by radar from the spherical walls of that room would collide at its very center. Compression would then be exerted from the outside and density would increase in the direction of the center. Nature does not work that way, however. Nature causes her explosions to take place as though they were confined within the flat walls of a room of four or many walls of such shapes as we see in crystals. If you cause such an explosion in your six-sided room, the outward expansion would no longer be even. It would not even be spherical because of the four corners, which would have to be filled. The outward explosion could no longer produce straight radial lines, which would reflect back in straight radial lines. Every radial line would have to curve in the direction of its corners, and as they approach those corners, their curvature would twist and increase in speed as they approach the corners. In a sphere, all radial lines are equal, but in a cube, the... Ooh, that's a funny word. I don't think I spelled that right. What could that be? But in a cube, the diagonal, diagonals longer, the diagonal are longer than the diameters. Okay, that's what that was. This fact accounts for the curvature, the spin, and the shaft. It also accounts for the disappearance of all curvature. If you study figures 19 to 43 for better comprehension of this effect, then realize that nature does not allow any explosion anywhere without regarding it all over her un universe, you will soon become familiar with her simple processes. 
The eight explosions shown in figure 77 are in cube relation to explosive charges placed out in open space in a cubic relation to each other. If they expanded into spheres, such as you see in figure 78, there would be a lot of empty space between them, which nature does not allow. So they continue to expand until they fill all space. Curvature then disappears, and so also does motion, as shown in figure 79. Every point on every face of those resultant cubes is zero in potential and motion, for they are planes of magnetic light. They are also mirrors, which reverse all direction of motion, which impact against them to extend them into the next wave field and radar them back to their point of beginning. When the world of science realizes that radar and polarization are one and the same effect, it will greatly advance its mechanics, for it is by this principle that any happening anywhere in the universe happens everywhere. This principle is the whole basis of the telephone, radio, television, etc. We have briefly described this principle, which makes polarization and a bilateral universe not only possible, but imperative. Likewise, it makes extension imperative. Now we shall apply this principle to very familiar, simple effects. Man makes a big gun by making a long tube which he seals at one end and places an explosive there. He even puts a twist in the bore of the gun to accelerate the spin of motion around the steel shaft which centers that tube. That motionless explosive occupies one still position in this zero universe until he ignites it. What then happens? A two-directional explosion takes place. The recoil is equal to the discharge, so he might just as well have left both ends of the gun open as far as the effect of polarization is concerned. The recoil was the opposite direction of polarity as that explosion began its division of stillness throughout the entire universe at the speed of 186,400 miles per second. Let us analyze what has happened. The center of the explosion is an unchangeable point of stillness in the magnetic light of creation. But we will call it gravity because we are seemingly dividing it into a shaft. Because of the tube, the explosion cannot expand symmetrically and radially from the point in space which it occupied while still. For it is not enclosed in a spear, it is enclosed in a shaft. Its spinnings encircle the walls of the tube at 90 degrees to the still shaft, which is developed because the explosion can no longer be centered at one point in space and therefore have but one center of gravity instead of many. It becomes a series of points in space from wh which form a shaft. If you can now comprehend that if the explosion within that tube is obliged to change position and move its centering point of stillness, the projectile which moves it, likewise, a sequence of points of stillness, you cannot see a projectile being ejected from the other end, but its equivalent is in that recoil. Now here is a, another cube curvature appears, curvature matures, curvature disappears. The outward pressures of radiation and centrifugal force lose all spherical form and curvature by disappearance into the six planes of zero curvature which bound all cubic wave fields. Can you not see that the same thing applies to an airplane? The plane moves for the same reason. An explosive is placed at one end of a tube which is made up of an engine and a propeller. The engine is sealed at one end because there is no opposing propeller there. 
If equal propellers occupied both ends of the engine, that plane would not move. Spinning rings that move around a center instead of an extended shaft of gravity, however, caused by the motion of the propellers. The plane itself would then occupy a position of stillness. Can you not see that it would always occupy a position of stillness no matter where it seemingly moved? And can you now not see that the spinning rings are the cause of that seeming motion? And can you not further see that the direction of motion is not in the projectile or the plane or of gravity, but solely in the divided pressures which cause that spinning motion? Now let us take the plane and the projectile out of the tubes which they centered. We refer you to the two cyclone diagrams, again, figure 51, 52. There is nothing that there whatsoever which is materially objective at their center. There is only the stillness which we call the eye. There is but an explosion of hot air there which causes expansion from the inside outward where cold air compresses it from the outside to inner density. Nature has made her two-way gun that way. A measure of desire energy is at its center. The eye is a shaft of gravity. Gravity is omnipresent. What difference whether there is a plane or bullet there or not? If there is a plane there, it changes position in one direction. Its change position in one direction is voided by an equal change in the opposite polarity direction. If we go into the machine shop, we will see a long shaft with many wheels upon it. They, they are all turning in the direction of motion, yet they are not changing their positions. They perform as much work or can do as much damage as the plane or bullet without changing their gravity position. Which is it then which demonstrates power? Is it the direction of motion around stillness or is it a shifting point of stillness? We now go into the laboratory. The physicist makes a two-way gun which he calls a coil. He does not seal one end of it, for he cannot. His, current, his electric current goes both ways and spins around its extending shaft in equality of potential. In this way he divides gravity and extends it in such a manner that both of each pairs of mates, thus divided, are equal. We shall now apply this principle to the Yi-Yang experiment. In the coil, above described, there is no material body occupying the cathode position as there is when a plane or bullet starts to move. In the Li Yang experiment, a material body is placed there to be polarized. Cobalt is not a balanced mated pair like carbon, however. It is but one of a pair, although it is very close to the balance amplitude point of its wave. When the current is turned on, the resultant effect is as though a steel rod were ins was inserted in the shaft of the coil, which is a half inch in diameter at one end and a quarter of an inch at the other end. Every physicist knows that both ends would then be different, for the equator of the rod would not be in the middle. It would be nearer, nearer the small end. The rod would not pick up an equal weight at its opposite end, ends, or the electric potential which does the lifting would be unequal. The small end would pick up a greater weight, for its rings would be smaller and spin faster. Another example will help clarify this one. The gun maker builds a two-way gun, but does not seal either end. If the tube is of the same dimension, from one end to the other, the projectiles ejected from both ends could be the same size, but if he made one end larger than the other, the projectiles ejected from one end would be smaller than those ejected from the other end. For this reason we say that carbon, sodium chloride, or potassium bromide would give equal projections from each end, for they are mated pairs, whereas sodium or potassium alone would give us unequal results 
as unequally mated pairs and sodium bromide or potassium iodide would give us unequal results in such an experiment as their cube crystals are distorted and for the same reason. Conclusion As our last words in concluding this example explanation of the Li Yang experiment, and in trying to explain the universe as a whole, we will draw a crude picture which should make it more clear even to the unimaginative. The universe is made up entirely of electric thought waves. Thought waves are nature's two-way guns, which are loaded with the energy of mind desire to give out from its centering self to all the universe. That is the explosive which motivates the universe. That is what makes creation appear and disappear. If you can imagine these two-way spiral guns, which are shaped like the spirals, which are shaped like the spiral shown all through this book, and if you can imagine them placed muzzle to muzzle all through the universe, you have one part of the picture clearly in mind. If you also imagine these two-way spiral guns to be of both atomic and stellar dimension, you will clarify the picture somewhat. The only thing now to complete the picture is in discharging all of those cosmic guns right into each other's muzzles so that the explosive, which is projected, collides as hot bodies, which are frozen into solids as they are ejected from the muzzles of those polarizing guns. That is the way that paired units become mated systems, which complete the purposefulness of the universe by re-giving to the Creator all that the Creator had given to them. Thus it is that the God of love manifests love to the fathers and mothers of creation, who in turn manifest love by their equal givings and re-givings of each to each other as united pairs, and they in turn re-give of love to their Creator to become one with Him. Thus it is that matter is created by the process of heating it by fast motion. Thus it is also that the cold of space freezes it to imprison it, until it is enabled to generate enough heat for its liberation. This fact is not known by man. He believes that matter is held together from the inside. Because of this belief, he does not know that matter is a powder keg which desires to blow up the universe. It is our belief that man will desist from helping matter to blow up the universe when he is made aware of the nature of matter as it is instead of the way he thinks it is. That has been our purpose in writing this book. We reverently launch it out upon the world with the hope and the deep prayer that it will save the earth from becoming a barren thing, which it will most surely become, if the deadly blue killer metals are built into ten-ton piles sufficiently long to make it forever impossible to turn back to the normalcy required for organic life. Our last word in closing is to say that a time would be reached within one generation in which there would be no way to turn back or the doom of organic life would then be inevitable. A postscript has been suddenly imperative on the eve of going to press because of an article published in Scientific America in April 1957. This article by Philip Morrison upholds the validity of the conclusion that the law of parity is now overthrown and that a right and left direction must henceforth be recognized as part of natural law. This conclusion is supported mainly by one of many drawings which illustrate the article. We are publishing that drawing to show that the same mistake has been made by this author that Messrs. Li and Yang made in Columbia Universe, University. At the left of, this, of the drawing, two particles are turning upon their gravity shafts, 
which could be electrons, planets, or suns. Around these spinning masses are circles with eras which show the direction of their turning. Naturally, these circles show an ellipse because they follow equators and are shown in perspective. At the right of these two spinning masses, a mirror has been erected to show that if these two masses were reflected in the mirrors of nature, such as radar, the spinning would be reversed. Upon this evidence, and similar evidence containing the same fault, a great conclusion of science is now added, which upsets the old concept of parity, which allowed for no distinction as left and right hand turnings. We have marked this mirror by the letter A. The great error of this drawing is that pressure mirrors in nature, such as radar, are not erected upon planes which follow the direction of polarity or gravity shafts. On the contrary, they are erected in planes of 90 degrees to polarity or gravity shafts. We are printing another drawing, figure 81, which shows three mirrors which are placed where nature places them. These we have marked A, A. If you will now note the reflections of the turning masses which we have indicated upon these mirrors, you can plainly see that the one direction of nature is upheld. And this is that diagram. A mirror placed parallel in plane with the direction of the shaft, or gravity, would naturally show a reverse direction of spinning, but radar our echo mirrors of nature are not placed that way. They are placed at angles of 90 degrees from gravity shaft. Here's another diagram. This is the way nature places her pressure mirrors which retain the same direction of spinning in the mirrors that they spin in the mass which acts upon them. There is no exception to this law throughout all nature. To help you visualize this effect more clearly, consider how impossible it would be to have a ball rebound into your hand if you threw it against a plane which parallels the direction of your ball. Or consider how impossible it would be for a cliffside to echo your voice if the plane of its face followed the, re the direction of your voice, as it does in Scientific American Drawing. Instead of in a plane of 90 degrees from the direction of your voice. Once more, consider how impossible it would be for radar instruments to detect the presence of a sheet of steel much bigger than a ship if that sheet of steel was placed the way the mirror in figure 80 is placed. Instead of being turned around so that its entire face could echo back to the radar instruments. Nowhere in nature do pressure walls exist which are not 90 degrees from the direction of polarity. For this reason, the conclusions arrived at in this article to support the Yi Yang theory are invalid. Now, I think I will not read any more of this and let this be the end because the rest is about the University of Science and Philosophy. And uh, it shows a picture of it here. There's another picture. And you can look at this information if you want to go to AbundantHope.net because this book is there along with many other books. This tells a little bit about Walter and Leo Russell. Not a whole lot, but there's a little bit, a little bit more information there. But I am anxious to get to the end, and so I am at the end. I have to say, I haven't understood most of what I've read. But only because I am not understanding of how these experiments are done, because I've never done experiments and even know what the references of this direction or angle or whatever really means, because I'm not an experimenter of this sort of thing. But I do know 
that like religion, science has its favorite versions that they just hold on to dogmatically. And when something new is discovered, they almost won't look at it. And if they do, they'll reject it a lot of times just purely because it violates their sense of, well, I've been proven wrong, and they don't want to be thinking that they have made a mistake most of their life of finding a wrong premise. Well, that really has a whole lot to do with ego and the need to be right. I don't understand that because I've never had such firm beliefs in something that I couldn't say, well, prove me wrong and I'll believe you. But there's not a lot of people out there proving anyone wrong. I guess I shouldn't say that. There's a lot of uh, scientific evidence that some scientists who are not afraid of, of talking about spirit, like Walter Russell wasn't afraid to do, are now approaching the subject. And they're doing a good job. But they're having, they're having to come up against those egos of other scientific minds who don't want to change. Bless their heart. It's just like with my sisters. They are fundamentalist in their beliefs about heaven and hell and God and Jesus. And no matter how I word it, which I don't even try anymore, they cannot hear reason. They always just go back to, well, the Bible says, and they interpret it the way they want to. And some things they ignore and other things they don't. Because I've read that Bible too, and there's a lot of things they can't explain contradictory things that are in there. And I don't feel one bit bad that I don't love that God of the Old Testament. I can't. Because that is a judgmental, egoic need to be worshipped, need to punish, need to change people to be somehow subservient to this powerful God. And I just can't have that thought about myself in relationship to God. I feel God in me. And while I don't understand it exactly like I would like to understand it better, I do know that God lives in me. But not just me, lives in everyone. He lives in those who I would call my enemy. So therefore, I must love them because they are part of God. Love them into the light. Because we cannot convert other people to our way of thinking. We can transform them only by our way of living. And they will see it in our living example of how that we live, and then they will perhaps be transformed or not. And if they don't get it, we have to let go of our desire that they do because eventually, in some lifetime, they have to get it. And it can't matter too much to us, even if it's our own precious family and loved ones, that they don't get it this time around. Just love them as best you can. Talk to them if they will listen, but if they won't, let it be. That's how I have to be with my sisters and with pretty much everybody. No one really in my life wants to talk about serious things. So that's why I read all these books. And I talk to the people that I'm reading to. And I love your comments. And... I feel like you're more my family than anyone. Also, the authors I read, I feel they're, they're family to me. Sometimes I feel their emotions. Because when you read their words, you're experiencing them. Those are their thoughts. 